Section 2 of The Living Animals of the World, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Mack, Tucson, Arizona. Living Animals of the World, Volume 1. Mammals by Charles Lewis Cornish, Editor. The Gorilla, the Orangutan, and the Gibbon. The Gorilla. The name of this enormous ape has been known since 450 B.C. Hanno, the Carthaginian, when off Sierra Leone, met with wild men and women whom the interpreter called gorillas. The males escaped and flung stones from the rocks, but several females were captured. These animals could not have been gorillas, but were probably baboons. Andrew Battelle, already mentioned, described the gorilla under the name of Pongo. He says it is like a man, but without understanding even to put a log on a fire. It kills Negroes and drives off the elephant with clubs. It is never taken alive, but its young are killed with poisoned arrows. It covers its dead with boughs. Dr. Savage described it in 1847. Later, Dr. Chaloux visited its haunts, and his well-known book relates how he met and killed several specimens. But Mr. Winwood Reed, who also went in quest of it, declared that de Chaloux, like himself, never saw a live gorilla. Von Kopenfels, however, saw a family of four feeding besides shooting others. The late Miss Kingsley met several, one of which was killed by her elephant men. The gorilla has a limited range extending from 2 degrees north to 5 degrees south latitude in West Africa, a moist, overgrown region, including the mouth of the Gaboon River. How far east it is found is uncertain, but it is known in the Sierra del Cristal. In 1851 and 52, it was seen in considerable numbers on the coast. The gorilla is the largest, strongest, and most formidable of the primates. An adult male is from 5 feet 8 inches to 6 feet high, heavily built with arms and chest of extraordinary power. The arms reach to the middle of the legs. The hands are clumsy, the thumb short, and the fingers joined by a web. The neck scarcely exists. The leg has a slight calf. The toes are stumpy and thick. The great toe moves like a thumb. The head is large and receding with enormous ridges above the eyes, which give it a diabolical appearance. The canine teeth are developed into huge tusks. The nose has a long bridge, and the nostrils look downwards. The ear is small and manlike. In color, the gorilla varies from deep black to iron gray. With a reddish tinge on the head, old animals become grizzled. The outer hair is ringed gray and brown. Beneath it is a woolly growth. The female is smaller, not exceeding four feet six inches and less hideous, as the canines are much smaller and the ridges above the eyes are not noticeable, a feature common also to the young. Timid, superstitious natives and credulous or untrustworthy travelers have left still wrapped in mystery many of the habits of this mighty ape, whose fever-stricken, forest-clad haunts render investigation always difficult, often impossible. Many tales of its ferocity and strength are obviously untrue, but we think that too much has been disbelieved that a huge arm descends from a tree, draws up and chokes the wayfarer must be false, for intelligent natives had confessed to knowing no instance of the gorilla attacking man. That it vanquishes the leopard is probable, that it has driven the lion from its haunts requires proof. Nor can we accept tales of the carrying off of Negro women and the defeat of the elephants too, must be considered a fiction, but we must believe that this ape, if provoked or wounded, 
is a terrible foe, capable of ripping open a man with one stroke of its paw, or of cracking the skull of a hunter as easily as a squirrel cracks a nut. There is a tale of a tribe that kept an enormous gorilla as executioner, which tore its victims to pieces until an Englishman, doomed to meet it, noticed a large swelling near its ribs, killed it with a heavy blow or two on the weak spot. Gorillas live mainly in the trees on whose fruit they subsist. They construct a shelter in the lower boughs for the family and is a lying-in place for the female. The male is said to sleep below with his back against the tree, a favorite attitude with both sexes to keep off leopards. On the ground, it moves on all fours with a curious swinging action caused by putting its hands with fingers extended on the ground and bringing its body forward by a half jump. Having a heel, it can stand better than other apes, but this attitude is not common, and Duchelieu appears to have been mistaken when he describes the gorilla as attacking upright. In captivity, only immature specimens have been seen, Barnum's great ape being one of the larger forms of chimpanzee. Accounts vary as to the temper of the gorilla, some describing it as untamable, while others say it is docile and playful when young. There is an American tale that a gorilla over six feet high was captured near Tanganyika, but nothing more has reached us about it. When enraged, a gorilla beats its breast, as the writer was informed by a keeper, who thus confirmed Duchelieu's account. Its usual voice is a grunt, which, when the animal is excited, becomes a roar. The orangutan. This great red ape was mentioned by Linnaeus in 1766, and at the beginning of the last century, a specimen living in the Prince of Orange's collection was described by Vosmer. There are three varieties of the orang called by the Dyaks Mias Papin, Mias Rambi, and Mias Kasu, the third of which is smaller, has no cheek excrescences and very large teeth. Some naturalists recognize a pale and a dark race. Most of our information is due to Raha Brook and Dr. Wallace. The species is confined to Borneo and Sumatra, but fossils have been found in India of this genus, as well as of the chimpanzee. The orang is less manlike than the chimpanzee and gorilla. In height, the male varies from 3 feet 10 inches to 4 feet 6 inches the female being a few inches shorter. It is a heavy creature with a large head, often a foot in breadth, thick neck, powerful arms which reach nearly to the ankles, and protuberant abdomen. Its legs are short and bowed. The forehead is high, the nose fairly large, the ears very human. The throat is ornamented with large pouches, and there are often callosities on the cheeks. The fingers are webbed, the thumb small, the foot long and narrow, the great toe small and often without a nail. The brain is man-like and the ribs agree in number with those of man, but there are nine bones in the wrist, whereas man, the gorilla, and the chimpanzee have but eight. The canine teeth are enormous in the male, the hair, a foot or more long on the shoulders and thighs, is yellowish red. There is a slight beard. The skin is gray or brown, and often in adults, black. The orang is entirely a tree-living animal, and is only found in moist districts where there is much virgin forest. On the ground, it progresses clumsily on all fours, using its arms as crutches, and with the side only of its feet on the ground. In trees it travels deliberately, but with perfect ease, swinging along underneath the branches, although it also walks along them semi-erect. It lives alone with mate and young, and builds a sleeping place sufficiently low to avoid the wind. Its food is leaves and fruit, especially the durian. Its feeding time 
midday. No animal molests the meas, so say the Dyaks. The python and the crocodile, both of which it kills by tearing with its hands. It never attacks man, but has been known to bite savagely when brought to bay, and is very tenacious of life, one being found by Mr. Wallace still alive after a fall from a tree when both legs had been broken, its hip joint and the root of the spine shattered, and two bullets flattened in neck and jaws. In captivity, young orangs are playful and docile, but passionate, less intelligent than chimpanzees, they may be taught to eat and drink nicely and to obey simple commands. One in the zoo at present has acquired the rudiments of drill. They will eat meat and eggs and drink wine, beer, spirits, and tea. An orang described years ago by Dr. Clark Abel was allowed the run of the ship on the voyage to England and would play with the sailors in the rigging. When refused food, he pretended to commit suicide and rushed over the side, only to be found under the chains. The orang is the least interesting of the three great apes. He lacks the power and brutality of the gorilla and the intelligence of the chimpanzee. The orang, said his keeper to the writer, is a buffoon, the chimpanzee a gentleman. It is worth remark that although all these apes soon die in our menageries, in Calcutta, where they are kept in the open, orangs thrive well. The gibbons. Next after the great ape in man-like characters come a few long-armed, tailless apes known as the gibbons. Like the orangutan, they live in the great tropical forests of Asia, especially the Indian archipelago. Like the latter, they are gentle, affectionate creatures and they have a natural affection for man. But it is in mind and temperament rather than in skeleton that the links and differences between men and monkeys must be sought. It will be found that these forest apes differ from other animals and from the true monkeys mainly in this, that they are predisposed to be friendly to man and to obey him, and that they have no bias towards mischief or monkey tricks. They are thoughtful, well-behaved, and sedate. The Simang, one of the largest of the long-armed, tailless gibbons, lives in the Malay archipelago. The arms of a specimen only three feet high measured five feet six inches across. This, like all gibbons, makes its way from tree to tree mainly by swinging itself by its arms. But the Simang can walk upright and run. One kept on board ship would walk down the cabin breakfast table without upsetting the china. The white-handed gibbon is found in Tenestrium, southwest of Burma. This ape has a musical howl, which the whole flock utters in the early mornings in the treetops. In northern India, in the hills beyond the Brahmaputra, lives another gibbon, the Hulak. One of these, kept in captivity, soon learned to eat properly at meals and to drink out of a cup instead of dipping his fingers in the tea and milk and then sucking them. The silvery gibbon, kept at the zoological gardens, was a most amiable pet and had all the agility of the other gibbons. It is very seldom seen in this country being a native of Java, where it is said to show the most astonishing activity among the tall cane groves. One of the first ever brought to England belonged to the great Lord Clive. The agile gibbon is another and darker ape of this group. The list of the man-like apes closes with this group. All the gibbons are highly specialized for tree climbing and an entirely arboreal life. But it is undeniable that apart from the modifications necessary for this, such as the abnormal length of the arms the skeleton closely resembles that of a human being. In their habits when wild, none of these apes show any remarkable degree of intelligence, but their living is gained in so simple a way by plucking fruits and leaves that there is nothing in their surrounding to stimulate thought. They do not need even to think 
of a time of famine or winter, or to lay up a stock of food for such a season, because they live in the forests under the equator. End of section two. Recording by Tom Mack.